But we're really excited to offer you guys um, the Pro Step Refresher course. Dr. Eric Baskin is going to be speaking to us tonight on minimally invasive solutions um, of the forefoot, specifically some um, hammer toe and DMMO options for us. And I will pass it off to him and um, he'll take us through the slide. If you guys have any questions, feel free to use the chat function. Um, and then we'll try to open it up to attendees um, on the back end of it for any questions regarding the presentation or any other pro step procedures. Thank you, Jen, I appreciate it. I appreciate the uh, the invite and the interest from all our attendees. Um, this is uh, this is a great uh, topic, one of my passions uh, in terms of foot and ankle surgery, and I uh, hope I can uh, bring you along the path that I've uh, that I've that I've come through. We were all familiar with uh, the Mika procedure, and it's uh, just got back from ACFAS. And so um, just a tremendous interest uh, all around um, in Mika and also in minimally invasive surgery in general. And so um, I'd like to keep the uh, groundswell going and I'd like to keep the momentum going and uh, sh share with you what I've, uh, what I've been doing over the past six, seven years and, um, and see uh, if, uh, if, there's any, if there's any questions at all regarding this and bring you along uh, my journey uh, into this uh, revolutionary uh, form of surgery. So uh, just to start out um, my, uh, my disclaimer. Um, so as I was saying before, uh, bunions, that uh, gets, uh, gets all the glamour, gets all the attention, um, but there's so much more that can be done with MIS, uh, plantar ulcers, hammer toes, metatarsalgia, uh, arthritis hallux limitis, uh, Bunyanet, Calcos, Diotomies, Haglands, and now Sharko. Um, so there's a lot of other uses um, besides just uh, the Mika. Um, to quote uh, David Redford, um, the, uh, bunion, uh, the bunion surgery minimally evasively is evolutionary, uh, but things like hammer toes and metatarsalgia is revolutionary. And I agree with those sentiments. Um, and so that's brings me to the beginning of my my MIS journey and what started me along this path and basically hammer toes is what kind of got me on this on this track um, hammer toe surgery uh, initially uh, open techniques uh, performed the way I was taught the way it's in the uh, taught in the uh, residencies and the way it's in the textbooks uh, over the past 30 40 years uh, I was performing the same way and I just was not getting the results that I, that I was trying, what I, that I wanted. Um, uh, from a didactic standpoint, from, from my x-rays, everything went well, but the patients were unhappy and I was unhappy with that, but because I wanted to, to, to satisfy the patients, not just have a good x-ray. And so on the left, you look at the traditional repair and uh, the toe is very straight, um, stiff, um, and uh, much longer than the other toes. Um, so here I performed uh, the traditional uh, surgery that's in the McGlamory's books. And um, although radiographically, and even from my perspective at the time, this was a success, the patient was extremely unhappy with, with the way it came out. Um, she didn't have pain, but she, she said, this doesn't really look like a normal foot to me, and it doesn't. Um, and so the patients uh, wasn't happy, and that's who, or really, all who matters in this scenario. Um, and so I started to look elsewhere and look at other options. And I looked into, I started using absorbable fixation. I started using uh, joint implants. I started uh, trying not to use any K wires. I tried every possible way available in the United States at the time, and I still wasn't uh, sat, still wasn't getting to where I needed to be. And then I came across some of the literature from Europe, uh, primarily from Mario De Prado, and um, a lot of the joint dissections and a lot of the cadaveric dissections um, were showing this, how they were doing it minimally evasively. And at the end of every journal article, if you read, uh, you'll always find the email address of the author. And so uh, through emailing and networking, I, start, I came across some of the uh, some teaching, some some lectures, and ultimately some uh, some cadaver labs, 
And that's what started uh, started my journey. So traditionally, hammer toe surgery open is joint destructive. There's hardware involved primarily. It's painful. It's uh, very painful. Some patients will say that the hammer toe surgery was worse than their spine surgery. It's unpredictable. And although it may relieve some of the pain, the patient doesn't always like the way that it looks and the patient satisfaction level is not always that high. And so that's what kind of led me again to, to this other form of surgery. As you can see, as uh, much, uh, much more of a natural look, a functional look, we preserve the joints. The pain is a fraction of what it is open. And in my hands and my experience is no question uh, that this is, um, this is revolutionary. And this is really uh, in my hands, the way to go. So the hammer toe technique formula uh, by Vern Wad Redford and Foot and Ankle Clinics 2016 basically is for, I would say, 90% of hammer toes, uh, the, my procedure to go to, um, where you do a tenotomy and capsulotomy. If you look at the, uh, at the metatarsal flanny joint above metatarsal, you're going to release the um, extensor tendons. You're going to then also release the extensor capsule. Um, or the dorsal capsule, the metatarsal flaney joint. And then you're going to eventually come plantar and you're going to release the plantar tendons, the flexor tendons, and then perform a plantar closing wedge osteotomy of the of P1 or the proximal phalanx. You're going to make a separate incision medially and perform a dorsal wedge osteotomy as well. And uh, if necessary, perform another uh, FDL tenotomy. More advanced techniques involve releasing only the uh, flexor deuterum brevis tendon. However, in my experience, in an older patient, you must release both of the tendons. I've found the recurrence if you just release the FDB. Younger patients where power and strength is more of an issue, um, then I, um, I tend to go more with the flexor deuterum brevis uh, isolated tendon release. So this uh, Haber Toe Technique formula um, is, uh, is essentially my go-to for the majority of, of hammer toes that, that I perform, and I found uh, a lot of success with it. So uh, there are several different things that you can do to treat hammer toes. Um, hammer, toe, hammer Toe MIS is uh, joint sparing, uh, so you don't, uh, you don't remove the joint, you don't fuse the joint. And so there's still motion left most of the time, unless it's a severe deformity. Sometimes they can stiffen up in the corrected position, but primarily there's still joint sparing. You can correct in all the planes, including transverse. You don't have to do tendon transfers. You don't have to do um, all this fancy work to get the toe to, to move transversely. You can create a bi-correctional wedge osteotomy to create correction both in the sagittal and transverse plane. And the toes are left with a much better functional cosmetic appearance with that hardware um, and a much natural uh, look to them. Also, if for some reason the surgery doesn't go as, as planned, uh, you're in your learning curve or a technical issue or, or not compliance issue, you didn't burn any bridges because if you need to do go ahead and do a fusion or, or a, um, an arthroplasty, there's no incision to fight or previous incision or any previous scar tissue to fight. So you don't burn any bridges with this procedure. Here you can see in this, in this particular patient who suffered from crossover toe as well as severe metatarsalgia, I performed both osteotomies of the proximal middle phalanx as discussed before, as well as the soft tissue work. But to correct the metatarsalgia, I performed what's called DMMO or uh, distal met metaphyseal metatarsal osteotomy. Um, and that is the uh, minimally invasive equivalent of a well osteotomy. And you can see no hardware uh, was utilized. The ground reactive forces basically repositioned the metatarsals to a, an anatomic uh, parabola. And with the use of taping techniques, we were able to maintain the hammer toe correction. Here you can see this is a tenotomy capsulotomy. And this is after, with, on the right, the puncture incision followed by the release of the flexor tendons. And then through that puncture incision, we're able to utilize a burr to create that plantar flexor osteotomy. And you can see here again, this hammer toe technique formula uh, being utilized.
Here's another example. Uh, this is an older um, osteotomy prior to Mika uh, called the Reverdin Isham procedure. It's essentially a minimally invasive Reverdin type procedure um, and an Aiken. But the important thing to realize is both the DMMO osteotomies and the hammer toe repair. And you could see that a fairly severe uh, deformity that open would be a, really a headache uh, and difficult to perform is relatively easy and powerfully effective uh, minimally invasively. You could also see there was a Taylor's bunion that we also addressed as well. So the DMMO, uh, you could see here, it's just the equivalent of, of a while. However, I will say that um, in general, I perform the osteotomy about uh, slightly more proximal than what's in this um, uh, picture. However, this is the traditional uh, technique that is very reproducible. And you can see it, once you make the osteotomy, it moves both proximally and slightly dorsal. And that, cor that corrects for some of the abnormal metatarsal parabola, which helps with the transverse plane uh, deformities uh, in, the, in the hammer toe repair, as well as gives some slack with the hammer toe repair. Uh, but it also will take the stress off the plantar aspect um, in the event that there is metatarsalgia. So, we need to perform usually two, three, or four, or two, three, four, and five, but it's extremely rare, 1% in my hands, that I ever perform an isolated metatarsal osteotomy. You're just begging for a transfer metatarsal, metatarsalgia or transfer lesion. So it's also fairly rare that I just do two and three, unless I have an absolutely perfect fourth metatarsal position. So I traditionally will do two, three, or four uh, most of the time. I'm just going to go back to this here. I would caution it to do this DMMO procedure only when you when it's absolutely clinically indicated. There's a very high potential to be overutilized, and I would never use it in conjunction with performing uh, a, a Mika unless you're extremely uh, well versed and experienced because if you, if it's not done properly and you perform it with a bunionectomy, you will get a reoccurrence of your bunion. You will get a, you will uh, increase the eye, in, unintentionally the IM angle because the metatarsal heads have a tendency to shift laterally. So in the beginning, when you're getting the the feel for this and going through this learning curve, do not combine them with a, a mica bunionectomy. They also have a tendency to take a long time to heal. And you need to uh, consult with the patient um, and consent with the patient that you know, the, one of the drawbacks to this procedure is that it can swell for three to six months, sometimes even up to a year. It is a uh, very, very high uh, gold standard potential in neuropathic patients with neuropathic ulcers uh, along the plantar aspect of the foot. It is extremely traumatic, it's easy to perform, and it's extremely effective. Uh, this is a patient that we all have in our practices where the, a digit was removed from gangrene and uh, it overloads the other uh, metatarsals, specifically the second, and you can see an ulcer that is formed there. The old technique standard was to remove, perform a metatarsal head resection, but you're just kicking the can in that situation because that you're gonna get the transfer lesion over to the third metatarsal and then the fourth metatarsal. So uh, to, to perform a, a DMMO in this patient, two, three, four, even five if necessary, is extremely effective because you walk them right away and they also typically may have been there for a year or two, will heal within two to three weeks, even with full weight bearing. It's very, uh, it's a very dramatic healing effect and it's a very, very powerful procedure. And you can see what we did here, we left five alone uh, but we, we uh, also addressed some of the hammer toes as well, and we performed DMMO, and this is literally two to three weeks post-procedure. It's amazing how fast these heal. You can combine this if you need to with a gastroc recession, and now you've got a really good thing going on, but, uh, uh, but I wouldn't caution about doing just a gastroc recession on everybody because the DMMO procedure is so powerful. Here you can see on the bottom right, we were able to correct for the hammer toes as well to prevent further uh, uh, ulcers down the road. Here's another patient, similar presentation, who has a fairly uh, thin, poor skin. And this was, he had this ulceration for many years, 
and um, went to hyperbaric oxygen, was in and out of wound care centers, and no one uh, operated on him. And rightfully so, uh, the skin is just, uh, it's just not surgically conducive skin. Um, I, I would not recommend um, a gastroc even recession unless you're, you're very atraumatic because of the skin and the vasculopathy that the patient had. So once optimized, uh, the DMMO just makes a lot of sense. And here you can see after performing the DMMO osteotomies on this patient, um, just a, a little bit of remnants, uh, mostly protective callus that's formed there. You can see pre-op, you can see the, the metatarsal parabola issue as to why he had the ulceration there. And this is uh, immediate post-op. Uh, so very, very powerful procedure in the therapeutic diabetic patient. There's even some backup literature from Israel. Uh, nice, nice size study and uh, more and more literature is now being published in the United States. Um, as far as th that very uh, stubborn ulcer underneath the metatarsal head, um, rather than perform a Jones Tino suspension or uh, hopefully not a, 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 um, a Keller procedure in this situation, but uh, or you could avoid doing a, a Jones or a dorsiflexor osteotomy if it's not rigidly plantar flexed by performing with the, uh, a sesamoid shave percutaneously. It's very easy to perform. Um, it's very traumatic. The patient can walk right away. Um, and you can see um, on the left, the post-operative, the preoperative on the right, on the, um, and uh, how effective it is. Um, again, these heal within two to three weeks uh, after the procedure. And you can see this is what uh, pre-op on the right, post-op uh, sesamoidal axial. On the left, you take about a third to two thirds of the, of the sesamoid out through a grinding using a wedge burr. However, you still maintain the, uh, the function. It's not like a sesamoidectomy. Uh, you still maintain the function of the sesamoids to prevent things like caca pallux drifting medially or laterally. So it's very another simple, powerful atraumatic procedure, which is really the tenets of uh, some of these really successful minimally invasive surgical procedures. Taylor's bunion, um, for a lot of, uh, a lot of surgeons taking on minimally invasive surgery. This is by far their most favorite procedure. Uh, it's fairly easy to perform. It takes about 30 seconds um, and it's, it's extremely powerful. It's essentially painless. The patient can walk right away. Albeit you have to perform it correctly. Um, it's not uh, foolproof and does take um, a certain amount of skill level, skill set, and uh, experience and learning curve. Uh, but that being said, I haven't performed an open Taylor's Bunyan uh, in probably a good five, six years. So great procedure. Here's another example. It's a great also if the patient has a plantar callus or plantar lateral callus, because you get a little dorsiflexion as well as, uh, as some uh, transverse plane correction as well. So there are two techniques. One is a, is a simple uh, metatarsal head osteotomy, almost like a Mika without the uh, chevron, more of an oblique cut, almost like a Mao bunionectomy. You can see pre-op and post-op, just a touch of elevation. And you can see the pre and post-op. This one happened to have a callus there. Um, and you can see that on the left side, the, the transverse plane correction and, and the right two large photos, The uh, the uh, sagittal plane correction. For larger MI, IMs, um, this is the go-to technique uh, really perfected by the, uh, by the uh, European minimally invasive surgical group now known as MIFAS, um, starting out as Gretmik. But uh, you're gonna do a closing wedge osteotomy leaving a lateral hinge uh, at, at the level of the diaphyseal metaphyseal uh, junction. You're just lateral to the tendon and um, it's performed fairly effectively in this situation. A lot of times also you can make a separate incision and actually uh, perform an exostectomy. And um, you can see in this, this particular specimen and the cadaver cat 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 specimen, as well as on the live specimen um, or live, live surgical uh, specimen that the, uh, there was a second puncture incision to take down the excess doses. Uh, again, very 45 angle technique, both dorsal plantar as well as um, lateral to medial. 
and a very effective technique. You can see in this particular patient um, uh, where, where uh, very severe deformity, uh, large callus along the plantar lateral aspect of the uh, left foot. And you see pre-op and post-op, um, just how effective it is. Uh, we perform the next mastectomy at, at the same time, as well as a four for reconstruction. You can see the uh, DMMOs as well that we performed. If you see, I do perform a while on uh, on when the joint is uh, severely uh, um, contracted or dislocated. You can see just how severe this deformity was preoperatively. So um, an alternative to what we were discussing with the traditional millivasive techniques is uh, a, a nice little plate um, that was developed. This is really interesting. Um, here you can see it's uh, it's got some rigid fixation uh, for, for those uh, patients that are fairly non-compliant who do too much walking, which you can do with uh, minimally invasive surgery, uh, as well as maybe the, the surgeon was not necessarily 100% uh, all in on MIS techniques. This offers a, a little bit of a happy medium. Um, here you can see we. this is one of the few circumstances where I did not perform a DMMO on the fourth metatarsal because you could see that fourth metatarsal position is actually right where it needs to be. So we did that, we performed it on the uh, second and third, and that, then the Taylor's bunion in the fifth, and you can see that, that this is completely healed. The fifth metatarsal is completely healed at about six weeks. Um, and you can see that the second and third metatarsals are still, dostalibes are still healing. There's still bone callus that's being formed. And even the proximal phalanx osteotomies are not healed yet. So just to show you how uh, stable that fixation is. So a nice, uh, nice plate. You can see the correction here. Same thing. This is completely healed. These are still healing. Um, uh, metatarsalgia with, with uh, crossover toe. This is like the greatest gift, in my opinion, that MIS has to offer uh, the surgeon as compared to open techniques. Um, you just can't get this type of correction open. Uh, it's just so, um, it, it, the results just come out really, really nice um, from both the functional and cosmetic uh, approach. This is that same procedure I discussed before. It's a fairly dramatic uh, repair, and that's why I, I like to show it. Um, but you don't have to have, not every hammer toe has to be this dramatic. Uh, a simple hammer toe uh, it works just as well as the uh, severe uh, hammer toe deformities. But you can see in this particular patient, if you look at the second proximal phalanx, we did open it up a little bit. We did create some transverse uh, correction uh, there as opposed to uh, traditional sagittal plane. Um, and here we talked about hybrid. Uh, this is a fairly severe uh, deformity that we corrected. But if you look at the second metatarsal, it, it is severely contracted, dislocation, dislocated. And actually the cartilage has adapted to a position articulating on the dorsal aspect of the, first, of the second metatarsal head. When I did, you can't, you can't fix that really basically. Uh, when I did open it up, um, I actually had to remodel the base with the burr um, because the, it just was not a functional joint at that point. And you can see the second digit at the base. Um, so part of the cartilage is intact, but part of it I had to burr down in order for it to sit properly. Um, you can see that we performed also DMMOs of the, of the uh, third and fourth metatarsals, as well as, a sec as, well as osteotomies. Um, you could see, though, because I'm fairly experienced in in the Mika and, and so forth, and we did fixate this, that I, I would perform the DMMOs. However, if, the, if I just if I was just performing uh, the abundant the severe without the, the contracture, and I would probably avoid performing the DMMOs on the second, third, fourth and metatarsals for fear of uh, reoccurrence. And you can see on the lateral view, very powerful correction uh, with this technique. Here's another example, again, uh, osteo, very osteoporotic bone, severe deformity. You just can't correct that second digit with MIS, at least in my hands. Uh, there may be uh, some Europeans uh, that, have, uh, that have heavy experience uh, that may be able to, but in my hands, a small incision uh, makes a big difference. The rest of the procedure, both the hammer toes and the proximal phalanx, 
and the other DMOs were all performed minimally invasively, and obviously the, the Halix valve was repair. Um, you see how I mean how just how functional, how powerful this correction is. Uh, neuroma. So um, I've had some interesting discussions with some of the uh, experienced users in the minimally invasive community, um, both podiatrists as well as orthopedists, and uh, we most of us are in agreement that neuroma may be a little over uh, diagnosed, and that a lot of times when it's diagnosed as a neuroma, it's actually metatarsalgia or even uh, capsulitis. Uh, this could be detriment, extremely detrimental to the patient, especially if you perform a neurectomy and the, this, the pain is still present, coupled with the fact that two, three years later, high incidence of stump neuroma, you have a pretty miserable patient. Um, so uh, in typically what I uh, will do is, um, I will do a, a DMMO, procedure on two, three, or, or two, three, and four. And then at the same time, I will release the deep transverse metatarsal ligament to perform that neurolysis. Uh, they did a study um, for these type of procedures and uh, substantially less opioids uh, with this than the traditional neurectomy. You can see here is a kind of a diagrammic model of how you, after doing or before, during the DMMO, you would do that release of the deep transverse metatarsal ligament to allow that uh, nerve to kind of breathe, so to speak. So there are other types of osteotomies as you start to develop experience. I don't recommend these right off the bat, but as you start to develop uh, increased experience in this, um, besides the traditional DMMO, which is shown right here, um, you can do a DICMO, which would be intra-articular, um, intracapsular, excuse me, if you're afraid in the situation where you're doing a hallux valgus repair of reoccurrence of the lateral translocation of the second digit, or you could do a DOO for severe uh, deformities, you could actually get up to a centimeter of translation, either proximally or meter laterally with the DOO memo. And I'm going to explain some of that in the future of this uh, talk. Uh, but there are three different types of metatarsal osteotomies, and that's where this kind of really gets interesting. So here's an example of where we kind of use all three, a very uh, complex uh, deformity, both how it's valgus, the fourth toe is being driven by both the fifth and, and third toe into the ground. Uh, there's a large IPK, submetatarsal head three. And uh, if I were to treat this open, uh, be, it would be uh, quite an adventure. Um, however, minimally evasively, uh, this is fairly straightforward and easy to perform. So you can see here, again, on this view, quite a little headache ahead of you. Um, the x-rays aren't pretty either. Uh, the patient was extremely understanding, enthusiastic about the procedure and had a great result. Um, you can see that with, uh, in terms of the uh, initial uh, preoperative, post-operative um, uh, x-rays, we performed the, uh, a um, MECA as well as a, if you look at number, a meta, second metatarsal, there's an intracapsular uh, D-I-C-M-O, um, as well as D-O-M-M-O in the third uh, metatarsal. The fourth metatarsal was in a great position, so we left it alone. And obviously, the Taylor's binding deformity and hammer toes as well. You could see that we were able, with the D-O-M-M-O, to move that metatarsal laterally while keeping the second metatarsal it, uh, without that translating laterally. You have to be very careful when you do an intracapsular osteotomy uh, to go very slow with the bear so that you'll develop an avascular necrosis. So here you can see pre and post-op at the fourth digit is now uh, viable again, and it sees the light of day, uh, and just a very functional, uh, happy patient. You can see the, the IPK is also gone. The fourth digit is in the correct position. And... Um, just a great overall uh, result. Um, also plantar plate, I think, is also uh, a hot topic now, uh, but in uh, grade one tears, um, I've found good success with just performing DMMOs. Um, to prevent any lateral translation, you can see I did the DOMO on, the, on two and three and four, I did the traditional D, um, DMMO. Um, but the same process occurs uh, if, if it's not ruptured, um, 
you could perform the DOMO and at the same time to prevent the floating toe, you could perform, here you can see a, uh, a plantar flexor osteotomy of the proximal phalanx. And here you can see the, the, the left foot is the same, the, the left foot is the foot that it was not operated on, but that's what it looked like beforehand. You can see that she's favoring uh, the MPJ plantarly, but the right foot is the one that we operate on and much more functional. So post-op, part of the correction is full weight bearing. So we would have the, we have the patient's full weight bear immediately in a post-operative sandal. I would avoid uh, the cam walkers because they can't decelerate the foot um, as like they can with it, with a surgical shoe because the, the, the boot is fixed. Um, specific dressings, which, uh, uh, which are uh, beyond the scope of this talk, but you were gonna perform specific dresses for three weeks. You're gonna elevate for the first two weeks. And then at six weeks, we tend to go back to full activities. Uh, so uh, the DOMO, DOMMO can also be used in severe metaductus. Here's an example of a patient um, uh, that um, had severe deformities. Um, we were able to perform uh, the lesser metatarsals uh, minimally invasively while performing adjunctive procedures. There was actually a paper that, uh, a poster that was presented at an ACFAS meeting. Um, and I also uh, presented this case at the uh, International Minimally Invasive Surgical Meeting. Um, here you could see that there's other issues going on. There's a calyx foot, there's a hind foot varus. And so some of this that, that I would perform now minimally invasively at the time, I performed open, such as Dwyer osteotomy and uh, perineal longus tendon, pair, tendon repair, gastroc recession. Uh, but that didn't, uh, we staged a procedure. The second stage, uh, we still had a, a lot of work ahead of us. And so uh, with the history of rheumatoid arthritis, we wound up fusing the great toe to prevent reoccurrence. I performed the pro mini uh, open uh, proximal chevron osteotomy and uh, a fifth metatarsal osteotomy open. Uh, but we performed the DOMMOs percutaneously, and you can see how far, how much correction you can get uh, with both shortening as well as lateral or even medial, if necessary, translocation. It takes a little bit of a leap of faith, almost like when you're doing a, uh, a, a breaking med or a limb lengthening or what have you, um, as the initial x rays look a little frightening. But as you can see, but basically, with the principles of, of this type of surgery, uh, you essentially leave that periosteum intact. And over time, the ground reactive forces place the metatarsals exactly where they want to, where they need to be. And you can see over time that healing taking place all the while um, full weight bearing. You can see pre-op immediately post, I'd say about six weeks after we remove the, the wires. And this is about six months. You can see there's contractions and lesser digits because of pain from the plate of the fifth metatarsal. And once we move the plate of the fifth metatarsal, you can see things kind of got, got back down to normal. Um, so I hope I explained the, uh, sort of my thought process into doing some of the lesser metatarsal distal forefoot uh, surgery. And uh, I hope your, uh, your journey is, is as enjoyable as mine has been. And uh, your patients will, will be happy. Your patients will thank you uh, for this. As I, in my hands and my experience, this is the best way to address these this pathology. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Baskin. Um, I didn't see any questions come through the chat, but I did want to let everybody know that this presentation has been recorded, and we will definitely be posting it to our ProStep Surgeon page. Um, and then we also have three more ProStep Refresher courses coming up this year, as well as some additional ProStep regional labs that you guys absolutely can sign up for. Um, so thank you guys. We appreciate you joining and hope to see you next time.